Thanks for the introduction, Nigel. Uh, so yeah, so we are going to have a, a talk about trying to simplify TFHE. Uh, and so this is a joint work by Ilaria Kiloti, Sarah El Kazadi, Damien Ligier, Arthur Mer, Thomas Montaigu, and Samuel Tapp. All right. So TFHE is the fully morphic encryption scheme. Um, this is based on LWE, so learning with error, the classical assumption, and everything is based upon that. So the ciphertext are constructed in the following way. So the idea is to have a message M that we are going to scale onto the most significant bits. And then we are going to compute a kind of a, a scalar product between a mask, which are random values. And we are going to add this. And we are completing the security by a noise, which is uh, taken from a, notion, um, a Gaussian distribution. So in the following, we are going to use both of the kind of the notations. So either a blue box with just the value of the plain text inside to represent ciphertext, or we are going to, dis the, to describe a little bit more uh, what is inside the plain text to have a bit more of an insight of what is going on. And so in this, we are going to have some of the values. First, the precision P. So this represents the number of bits on which the plain text is going to be encrypted. Uh, and then there is be two uh, specific modulus. So the first one is the message modulus, and the other part is the carry modulus. So the carry modulus is there in order to be able to absorb the linear operation that we are going to compute. All right, so we are not going into the full details of everything, but in the, if you want to use TFHE, the first thing is the programmable strapping. So that's why TFHE is most famous for. So the idea is uh, this is a fully morphic encryption scheme, right? So we have an operation in order to be able to reduce the noise all along the computation. And during this noise reduction, we are also able to compute a function, which is a univariate function that we are going to give as an input. And at the, the end of the programmable strapping, this means that we are going to have the function applied to the message. On the other side, when we are co computing a PBS, uh, we'll have two different encodings, meaning that the output keys is generally different from the input keys. And so we would like to have something which is kind of consistent. So we are going to use a key switch. And so the idea will be to switch the key first before going to the PBS so that when we are computing a key switch and then a PBS, the encoding is the same, meaning the encryption key will be the same. There are also the possibilities to compute some linear operations. And so this is the classical thing. We can do additions and multiplication by scalar. And so in the following scheme, we are just assuming that omega is equal to 1 to simplify a little bit. All right, so this is one of the main tools that we are going to use. And there is a huge restriction in it. This is the precision of the message. And using the PBS, we are kind of restricted to 10 bits maximum to compute over plain text. All right, uh, another tool that we are going to use a lot is what we call the bivariate PBS. So basically, this is a PBS, but we are going to use the free space, so the space for the carries, and we are going to concatenate two messages into this. And th the magical thing with that is now we are able to have bivariate functions to be computed over it. So in this case, we are computing the multiplication between M1 and M2, and so the first step is to concatenate, concatenate M1 with M2 with a simple addition and shift. And then, once we have that, we can express the univariate function as a bivariate function with two inputs, so m1 and m2. And so in this case, we then are computing the multiplication. So the thing is, when we are using this, this puts some of the constraints, because we need to be sure that we have the space to put the second message into the first ciphertext. So we have a constraint that the message modulus is at least uh, is, uh, less or equal to the carry modulus. So this is just the, a way to be able to add the ciphertext and then do the concatenation properly. All right, so in this thing, the idea is that if we want everything to work correctly, we will need to have many, many things. So for this toolbox to be good, we need first to have the correctness. Of course, we want the computation to be correct, right? We want to ensure the security, since we are doing cryptography. And then we want to be sure that the performance are super good. However, if we want to verify everything, we will have a lot of parameters to deal with. So some of the parameters are mixing, like building into both of the, um, of the categories. So this is kind of stuff. So I'm not going into detail of this, right? But there are a lot of stuff. And this is super complicated to work with. So the idea to simplify our life when working with TFHE is to have a kind of a parameter oracle. So the client is going to give some of the information, like the precision of the plain text you want to work with, the number of linear operations that you want to do, the error probability, I'm going to be more into details about that later, and the security level. And from this input, we have an oracle, which is able to return all the best parameters, ensuring the correctness, the, the security, and the best performance. So this was uh, already presented last year at, at FHG.org. 
And so the question that we are going to ask in now is, OK, we have an oracle. However, how can we show that the oracle is correct? Meaning that this is indeed verifying everything of the, the requirements, so the security, the correctness, and the performance. And so everything, if we want to have FHA to be super f easy to use, needs to be verified by default, and the user doesn't have to have any questions about it. So this is the first thing. So how can we be sure that the oracle that we have produced is reliable? The second thing is if we want to have people using uh, TFHE, is that we are need to, to provide uh, types that are way larger than 10 bits, right? And so ideally, we would like to mimic the classical types what we are using in any programming language, like U42, U64, for instance. So basically, the thing that we are trying to answer in this presentation is how we can make FHE match kind of the same constraint that any programming language have, so that people can just adapt their current program using FHE. All right, so we are going to have three parts. The first part is will be about trying to make the Oracle reliable. Then we are going to build the, the integer over it. And then we will have a look to some benchmarks. OK, so let's go for a reliable Oracle. So we need to, to verify free stuff, right? So let's go first with the security. Security is kind of an easy one, right? So to verify the Oracle, we are basically using another Oracle, what we trust, which is the lattice estimator. So the idea in this is how can we ensure that we ensure always the security? So the first thing will be from the lattice estimator to have many, many, many samples so that we have many parameters. And then we're able to do a model for the security, which is kind of function, taking as input the LW dimension, the ciphertext modulus, and the security level that we want. So some of, of these parameters can be fixed. So in TFHE, we can fix the ciphertext modulus to be equal to 64, the security level as a classical one, which means 128 bits of security. And then there is still the LW dimension. Yeah, 103 foot bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so once we have that, we have kind of a model to for the security, right? And so the idea is now we are able to give some of the parameters, and the last part is to check that. So we can once again reuse the assist estimator to verify that our model is correct by just sending back the parameters that we get. So the new variable this year is the variance that we have what we are going to use for the noise. And with, with, with all these parameters, we are sending back to the lattice estimator, and then we are sure that the parameters are indeed secure. So this is the easy one. For the performance, we can we kind of uh, applying the same method. So in this case, we want to have a cost model, meaning that we want to be able to predict the cost of the operation of, the, for, for instance, for instance, the bootstrapping. So what we can do is start with benchmarks without. Get, like by getting rid of the correctness, just launching benchmarks with different set of parameters, and just so, so that we can have a kind of a model which will tell us the impact of the performance of the different parameters. And so once we have that, we have a cost model. So this is going to use the, the complexities basically of all the operation plus the values of CT to the benchmarks, right? And then we are trying to minimize this cost. And then once we have a model, the idea will be to see if our model matches the reality. And so we are going to have the, the prediction and compare it by relaunching again the benchmarks to see if everything is fitting. So security and performance are kind, of easy, are kind of easy to verify. The last one is correctness is way more complicated. So the correctness, we need to do many, many samplings once again. But the thing is, in this case, we need to sample the noise. And the noise it will be present in many things. So the ciphertext, but also the, all the keys that we are using for to do compute the bootstrapping or the key switching. And so from this and the noise model, so the noise model is basically some formulas that we can derive from everything. So when I say everything, this is basically some distribution that we are trying to study, right? And so we have a noise model in which we can predict how the noise is going to grow all along the operations. But everything is a distribution, so we cannot have 100% insurance um, that everything will be correct. So this means that all the computation will be correct up to a failure probability that we call pay-fail. And so the thing is, from this sampling, then we have a model, and then we want to check the correctness. However, practically, this may be a bit complicated because the failure probability might be very low, and so this is complicated. So we have basically, basically two stuff to verify. The first thing is checking that the assumptions that are done onto the noise formula are correct. So the hypothesis is that we are going to use Gaussian noise distribution, right? But then we are missing everything with other distributions, like the uniform one. And so the thing is we are going to use the central limit theorem, CLT, and say, OK, we have so many uniform mixed with some Gaussians that we are finally converging with some kind of a Gaussian. So this is something we are going to apply. And this is kind of an assumption, because the CLT is true in the infinity world, and we have not an infinity number of samples, practically. 
by assuming that everything will be a Gaussian, this is good because the noise will be um, fully described by only two variables, which are the variance and the expectations. And practically, the expectations, we can say that this is in general zero because the Gaussian will be centered. So first thing is to verify that uh, indeed, in the end, we have a Gaussian distribution. So to do so, there is a, a well-known test we call Shapiro Francia that we can apply. And this tells us that indeed, after computing a BBS, for instance, the output uh, distribution of the noise verifies a uh, Gaussian distribution. The second part is to, is to verify that our computations are correct. So we are still making some hypotheses that I'm not going to go into details right now. But we need to be sure that we are a bit pessimistic in the theory so that the practical stuff will be better than the things that we are expecting. So that's the first step. The second step is now to verify that the error probability is the correct one. So if we have an error probability to 2 to the minus 40, for instance, this means that this is something super rare. And so if we want to verify this using classical Monte Carlo, which is kind of a brute force to verify this, we cannot do this. So if we want to verify 2 to the minus 40, for instance, we might run for two years to have enough failure. So this is not practical at all. So the idea will be to use another approach, which is called important sampling. And in this case, we are going to define a lot of thresholds that are way easier to match. Because the thing is, if we want to see the things, the, the, all the cases where it fails, this means we have to go into the queue of the Gaussians. And this is, by definition, a rare event. And so we are going to define a lot of thresholds that are way easier to reach. And then, using conditional probability, we're able to run, in, let's say, two days, something that verifies that the error probability or the failure probability is correct. So that's the two parts. So now, we are able to verify both the, the security, the performance, and the correctness of the thing up to a certain pro uh, error probability. All right. So now we have kind of confidence into the Oracle, which is good. So we can trust our Oracle. And we have, uh, we have succeeded into having one of the goals. However, if we take the full, the full thing, the client still needs to put a lot of information that are not super easy to work with. Like precisely the precision, the, linear, the number of linear operations, this kind of stuff, this is not super easy for anybody to work with. So the idea is now, how can we fix these last parameters? So to do so, we can, we can take some, some assumptions. So the error probability is going to be fixed to 2 to the minus 40 which is kind of acceptable because this is close to the hardware error that are happening, so this is super low. Um, we have also a thing that from the precision, since we are using the bivariate PBS, we are also able to fix the number of linear operation a priori. So we don't need to have something which is completely uh, free as a parameter for the user, and we can fix something to be sure that we are still able to every time compute a bivariate PBS. So by using that, we have a, a formula that defines us the number of linear operations. Security is pretty easy. We are still thinking of 128 bits. And so the last one is about the precision. So which precision should we take? So the thing is, from the, the cost model that we have, we are able to generate uh, this kind of graphs. So this is a graph of the, the cost of computing a key switch and a BBS, depending on the precision. And so we can see that there are two tendencies in this curve, that up to four bits, there is one of the, the slope. And then after this, we are, we are seeing that the slope is more exponential. So the cost is in a logarithm um, scale. And so once again, since we, are, uh, we want to be able to compute bivariate PBS, this means that we need to have enough spaces. And so if we are taking one bit of precision for the message, we also need one bit of precision for the carry. Two bits of precision for the message, we need two bits of precision for the carry. And so this means that for us, the optimal precision that we need to use is four bits. So by this, we are basically fixing everything. And so now the client has no question. If everything is done for him. And so now that we have this basis, we are able to build upon it the homomorphic integers with larger precisions. So let's say uh, we have as an input message something which is super large, 64 bits, for instance. So the first idea is, OK, now we know we have four bits to represent everything. But the four bits, once again, there is two bits for the message and two bits for the carry. So when we are going to encrypt everything, the first step will be to have some chunks. So split the initial plain text into many, many chunks of two bits each. And then once we have that, we are going to encrypt independently each of the chunks using the same key. So in the end, if we want to represent a super large message integer, we are going to have many LW ciphertext encrypting two bits of the message each. By using this kind of decomposition, we are able to redo all the arithmetic. So for instance, the addition is pretty easy. And so this, this thing represents the integer that I have encrypted. 
And so if I want to compute an addition between two of this in um, set of ciphertexts, the idea would be to just compute the additions between both of the, the, the chunks. So the thing is, this is super easy. However, in the end, we'll have something. We might have a carry. So we don't know everything is encrypted, right? But in the worst case, we will have a carry. And so what we have is that the input encoding is different from the output encoding. And so this is not super good, because when we're in this, we are not able to apply any bivariate BBS. So we are kind of stuck at this point. So the goal, the goal of this, if we want to go back to the same encoding as the input one, means that we need to be able to propagate the carries. To do so, there is a classical algorithm where I'm going to take the carry from the least significant block, and I'm going to propagate everything to the next block. So the idea will be I'm going to start by extracting the message, extract the carry, then I'm going to add the carry to the next block, and then I'm going to do the same thing with the next block, and so on and so on. So this is working. However, this is a super sequential operation. And as, as we have seen before, we have many blocks of ciphertext that are kind of independent. So we are not able to leverage the parallelism using this kind of operation. And if we want to fulfill the, the constraint of having the same input encoding as the same output, uh, the same input encoding and the same output encoding, sorry, this means that this operation will be used a lot. Since I'm going to compute an addition, then I need to compute a carry propagation, and so on. So this might be super costly. So the idea will be to try to leverage the parallelism by having a faster way to propagate the carries. So to do so, I'm not going to be super detailed about that, but the overall idea will be we are going to just focus on the carry, and we are going to associate an uncutting with each possibilities for the carry. And so we can represent the thing by, OK, I have a value, which means I can still have a carry added to that, and I'm not going to expand to so much, meaning that I will stay into the two bits, for instance. So in this case, I know I'm, I'm never going to generate or propagate a carry if a carry is added to that. I have the case where my message is full, and this means that if someone is added a carry to my block, then I need to propagate again. And then there is the, the case where this is already a carry or something, so we need to do something with that. And so for all possible value of the message, we are, uh, we are going to associate the right encoding to this. Once we have done this, the idea now will be to have a kind of a truth table, which gives us the, the rules that we need to apply depending on each of the value of the carries. So this is something which is stateful depending on the previous state every time. And so every time we see two arrows, this means that we need to compute a bivariate PBS and we are going to update the status of the carries. So this is to take only care of the carries, right? We know that this is going to converge. And in the end, we will have only the carries that are well done. And so the last part will be simply to add this to the message, the computer PBS to clean everything, and we will be done. So the major advantage of this is, as we can see, that the, the depth of the, like the depth of the kind of the tree that we need to compute is in log. And so we take really advantage of the parallelism because each of the block will be done in parallel. And globally, if we are taking the latency of this, this will be way smaller than the sequential approach. All right. So I'm not going to detail all the possibilities. However, using this representation and all the carry propagation stuff, we are able to uh, generate all the operators, so mimic exactly all the language programming. So we are able to compute the comparison, the bitwise operation, and so on. We are able to have the full arithmetic, so the addition, multiplication, division, this kind of stuff. All these things that I've just shown you is um, using unsigned integer. However, we can apply the classical thing with the tooth complement to have also signed integers. And then we are also able to have something to detect the overflow. So this is a bit, uh, a bit strange, because like, everything is encrypted, right? So we don't know if an overflow occurs or not. So the idea will be to have a flag, which is also encrypted, and which will contain this information. And so by the end of the execution of the program on the instruction, the user will be able to say, OK, there is an overflow occurring at some point. All right, uh, so that was for all the operations. So now let's have a look on the timings. So if we want to benchmark everything properly, the first question is how to benchmark FHE. And this is a super complicated question. And we don't mean to have a real answer to that, but we try to answer it, right? So there are many things that we need to take into account. So for instance, the security, because the security will also have an impact on the performance. So we need to fix this. We need to fix the, um, the failure probability, because this also has an impact on the parameters, and that's the performance. 
And then we need to define which kind of thing we want to compute. So the NFHC graph of operator, meaning that we are going to compute a function of our plain text, and this has to be defined. I don't know, for instance, an addition or a multiplication, this kind of stuff. And this is also at this point that we are putting again the constraint of having the same input encoding, the same encoding as the input and output. And this is super important because, as we have seen before, we need to take this, the carry population, into account into the timing. So this is a non negligible part of the stuff. And then, of course, all the, the, the parameters like the related to linear operation that we have seen before. So this is new to FHE, I would say, if we want to compare properly um, execution of, a ben like execution of a FHE schemes. And then there is the, the classical things that we need to fix the hardware, of course. So in our case, we are going to use a, a large machine, which is cloud-based audio-based stuff. And then there are mainly two um, kind of measure, the latency and the throughput. And in what follows, we are going to focus on the latency. So if we have a look at the benchmarks, uh, so the first, the first two arrays are about computing a key switch on a PBS. So we are using TFHRS, and we are using a uh, failure probability to 2 to the minus 40. And so we, we can see that depending on the precision, if we are computing two bits, so kind of the booleans, we are around six milliseconds, six milliseconds, where the, for the four bits, so the ones we are uh, using the most, we, we are a bit more than 12 milliseconds. So just for uh, the information, there is also a possibility to parallelize the PBS to the cost of having larger keys and using more threads. And in this case, we can almost divide by two the cost of the PBS for the, each precision. And so if we are trying to compare with the other existing libraries like TFHE lib or OpenFHE, then we, are, we have to shift the, pro the failure probability because we are using parameters that are given from the papers, for instance, and so they are in 2 to the minus 80. And so in this case, we are running from 8 milliseconds to 19 milliseconds and 21 milliseconds for a PNFH. So why is it important to benchmark the key switch and, the, and the, the key switch bootstrap? Because this is the building block that we are going to use to define all the operation of our integers. So that's why we are using next DFHRS to compute all the integers operation. And so about the timings that we get, so we put only for the 32 bits and the 64 bits for unsigned integers. But we can see so there are a lot of numbers. But the idea is that basically all the operations are around 100 milliseconds for 64 bits, which is kind of OK. However, there is still something that's are pretty slow. This is the multiplication, which is around 400 milliseconds. And the worst one is definitely the division, which is more than 8 seconds. So there are some stuff about that. There is a poster about the division if you want to have a look. Uh, and so just to say, everything is on a parallelized machine. We are leveraging a lot the parallelism. So this is a huge machine with a lot of cores. All right. So as a conclusion, um, the idea is how to make FHE match the constraints of the classical programming language. And to do so, the first thing was to be able to get rid of all the cryptographic complexities, so basically adding the parameters. And so we have something in which we can rely, which is the Oracle. And then there is still something that the user needs to provide, like the precision, this kind of stuff. We also get rid of this complexity. We fix everything, so we have static parameters that we are providing to your users. So of course, this might not be the most efficient for all the use cases. However, this is super generic, and we can build the stuff. So this is kind of similar to what we are using in programming language. And so now, the, the next step is what, like, there is a lot of things to do, but this opens the door to anyone, even the people who don't know anything about the cryptography, to participate into improving the operation. Basically, that there are some constraints that are kind of similar to the hardware development, and so anyone could participate in uh, developing and improving the, the FHE operations. And of course, like, there are we have a lot of presentation today, Having also cryptographers working on FHE is still super important because timings are still kind of slow and we want to improve everything, so everyone should uh, take a piece of working on FHE. That's all. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Oh, yeah. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, could you please explain better the slide where you uh, compare the 40 bits of uh, 2 to the minus 40 probability of error versus 2 to the minus 80. I, I wasn't able to compare the two cases. So, so yeah. the first one is just to give the timings, right? So this is the classical thing, and we're using this practically. 
The idea is we also want to compare with all the other libraries just for these operations. And to do so, we are using Tutomize 80 because, for instance, in OpenFHE, they are using a different technique to compute the PBS. So we are using the parameters they are providing and they are also claiming that they are having an error probability which is 2 to the minus 80. So we adapt the parameters to be able to have a fair comparison and verify all the constraints that we list before. So what, what would be the precision in the, in, the f in the one below? And so in this case, this is for n gate, so this is Boolean. So two, two bits? Yeah, two bits. Okay. So does this mean that you have like a 10 or 20 percent overhead only f if you want to go to 80 bits of? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's the thing. That's the thing. So the the error probability has a, a huge impact. Might have a huge impact onto the the performance. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? No. Okay. Let's um, thank the speaker again.